The title of my thesis, as I mentioned, is Deep Aerial Representation Learning Using Weak Supervision. And I would like to start my presentation by going through the main um, components of, of this title, explaining a little bit them to contextualize uh, my work. So first of all, um, representation learning can be thought of as a, as a machine learning in which um, um, a model is, pre is pre-trained in a task in which we are probably not generally interested, but by training this model, uh, we can obtain representations that are suitable for a number of downstream tasks that we really want to solve and for which maybe we don't have uh, that many, that much amount of, of data. Um, we are working with deep outdoor representation model. This means that we will only be using the uh, deep models such as convolutional neural networks in the later part of the thesis uh, transformer models. And uh, there would be audio music models. So we won't be using any other type of data as input to the models. It will be only uh, spectral representations based on the waveform as input. And we will have a different type of data in the thesis, but they won't be used as input. They will be used to create training target to the models that we will be developing. Uh, finally, a crucial part of the <clears throat> This is, is weak supervision. This is uh, not a well-defined concept, and there, there are different ways of, of, of thinking about web supervision. In our case, we consider it in contrast to a strong supervision. So when you think about training um, machine learning model, in strong supervision, typically you create the ground truth for the model on purpose, and it's typically done by experts. So it can be expected to be exhaustive, so there are no missing labels, and there's low amounts of label noise. In the other hand, when we have with supervision, typically the data was not created on purpose, so it's created um, for other uh, purposes, but, um, not for training the models, and they are leveraged for this task. So uh, typically, it's not done by expert in the task, and it can be expected to be partial, so not completely labeled, and contain uh, larger amounts of noise. Um, apart from this, there are another uh, content I think is worth mentioning. It's not part of the title, but the task that we are interested in and that we will be using to evaluate our representation learning is mostly sequence level uh, classification task, so tagging data set. And particularly, we will be using taxonomies um, regarding musical genre, musical moods, and context, and instrumentation of music. With that said, uh, I would like to uh, move now to the PhD on, uh, outline, so the main uh, branches of research that we have been doing that will also serve to uh, guide um, the, the, the outline for this presentation and the sections that we will be dividing the presentation in. So the first uh, section of this presentation is the introduction, and we will be introduced the main pillars that motivate uh, this research. Uh, namely representation learning in the context of MIR, the development of Essentia library here at the MTG, and the industrial uh, application uh, context that, that we have uh, also here at the MTG. This um, section corresponds to the first chapter of the thesis. In the second section, we will cover representation learning based on labels, and here with labels we mean semantic uh, labels. This corresponds to the third chapter of the thesis. Um, and uh, Basically, we are answering the question if representation models uh, based on this type of supervision improve the generalization capabilities of downstream classifiers. So we have uh, two publications regarding this topic, and we will also present the Discox FNET model, which will be uh, the baseline for the rest of the research on the thesis. In section three, we will cover representation learning based on music uh, metadata. This is like a branch of research trying to improve the performance of the Discox FNET model. We have uh, two publications and an industrial PhD uh, in this um, part, using this part, this type of supervision. And we also have a pattern developed in the context of, of the industrial uh, PhD in Utopia Music. Um, so this is, uh, corresponds to chapters four and five of the, of the thesis. Um, a second research line is not related to the um, type of uh, supervision used for the models, but to the architecture that we use to train them. And here in section four, we are investigating representation learning with transformer using a training technique called patch out. This corresponds to the sixth chapter of the thesis. Uh, and we want to understand if we can get better representation learnings by using this training paradigm. So we have a publication in ISMIR regarding this type of, uh, uh, using this type of architecture. 
And finally, the last research direction, direction is uh, covering section five of the presentation is related to interpretability in the context of models trained uh, on top of uh, representation learning uh, models. This uh, corresponds to the seventh chapter of the thesis and the goal is to create, create uh, classifiers that are interpretable while being based on uh, pre-trained representation learning models. Additionally, in the seventh uh, section, um, uh, of the presentation, we will cover application and outreach. So the efforts that we have been putting into bringing uh, these models to the audio community, so making them accessible in different platforms and in different services. And this we will be talking about essential models, that is our repository where we have been putting the uh, resulting uh, models uh, created during, the, during this uh, PhD. So um, after going through uh, these different research lines, uh, research lines we will have uh, final conclusion section, we will be uh, wrapping up the, the conclusions of my thesis. So, um, I'll start with the uh, introduction. The first question that we are addressing uh, when we started this PhD is why representation, why doing representation learning uh, research? So, um, one of the motivations to start this research plan is the, like, the lack of availability of um, strongly supervised data to train models. This makes a very suitable scenario for a, a representation, representation learning setup in which you pre-train models using weakly supervised uh, large amount of data available on, 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 online. And then you use the representations to fine tune or train smaller models using a small data set with strongly supervised uh, labels. Uh, this, uh, another very relevant uh, context for the beginning of the thesis was the development of self-supervised approaches such as uh, contrastive learning that were allowing to improve a lot of the performance uh, in, uh, from, compared to, to, to previous approaches. So one of the motivation, uh, one of the goals of this thesis is to understand how what can we combine this self-supervised method with uh, the supervision sources that we have in order to improve the performance. And finally, operating with this uh, approach, uh, representation learning based uh, uh, embeddings based on representation learning models is very suitable for specific uh, research scenarios. So it allows for creating data set where the dimensionality is small, so they are easy, more easy to, to share them. Um, we can prevent having copyright issues so if the embeddings are not uh, reproducible, so you cannot go back to audio. And it also allows for simplified uh, pipelines, so situations in which people can train models on embeddings with low effort because they don't have to know the specific of working with, with uh, audio deep learning. So regarding the other pillar of motivation for this work, uh, essential, essential and industrial context, um, for those of you who doesn't know, Essential is an open source uh, library and collection of models developed here in the MTG. And we have uh, two approaches to create solutions in Essentia. The, one, the first one is uh, DSP algorithms, and the second one is um, data-driven models that address different MIR tasks. So in this context, uh, representation learning supposed a game changer in the sense that it makes much easier to create this, this type of data-driven solutions with uh, less training data and less compute uh, requirements. So it allows uh, for ad addressing much more tasks with, with lower effort. Additionally, if we think in industrial application, a representation learning based uh, paradigms are very suitable because typically uh, extracting representation with the, with, the, with the embedding model is expensive and takes a lot of compute, but once you have these data sets of embeddings, you can use them to, to train and perform is, uh, inference with a large number, number of downstream shallow classifiers that are light, lightweight, so it's very convenient um, to reduce uh, inference uh, and time cost uh, uh, using application based on deep learning models. So to finalize uh, this section, I want to show an example of um, essential uh, uh, implementation of a representation learning pipeline where we have a model implemented in essential running in real time and feeding uh, four classifiers simultaneously. And with this, we want to simplify the flexibility of this setup to, to train models intended for different tasks and to operate in real time very efficiently uh, with a C++ uh, backend.
So this was just an example, and it was using one of the first models that we uh, proposed in the development of the, the PhD, not the most fun ones. But it allows you to, to imagine the type of applications that we can reach with, with these models. And we have been um, asked for developing models for very different contexts. So for example, developing system that can uh, predict aggressiveness of music to control lights in a music show or to control uh, the qualization for a hearing system, so specific to the genre of music. So this representation pipeline, representation learning pipeline allows for developing this kind of applications efficiently. So with, this, with that said, uh, let's move to the first uh, branch of research on the PhD, uh, PhD. So representation learning based on labels. Um, here, uh, labels, we refer to semantic labels or tags. Um, so the motivation to uh, start, this was one of the first pieces of research that we did in the thesis, and the motivation was that there was, back then, like four years ago, a growing availability of, of models pre-trained and that were being published by, by the MIR community and the audio uh, community. And the first idea was to understand the performance of the models and if the features contained on these models could be used for the downstream tasks that we were interested in at this uh, moment. Um, the other motivation was the existence of the Discox uh, site, that is a website I will introduce in a bit with a large amount of avail availability of music that we can use to create representation model um, leveraging the outcomes of the previous experiment comparing uh, state-of-the-art models back then. So our goal is to propose representation learning models for music and to assess the impact of the representation model in the generalization capabilities of the small downstream classifiers that we will train. Um, the first research question then is which is the best pre-training task that we can use to, to create uh, features that are useful and for this we will uh, evaluate a number of pre-trained models uh, from, from, from the state of the art for sound and MIR tasks. So in our preliminary uh, evaluation, we consider a number of uh, models that were state of the art in the task back then. So we have models for music tagging, for general purpose sound tagging, a uh, self-supervised model for audiovisual correspondence, a model intended to, to, to do tempo classification, and a model for source separation. And our evaluation setup uh, consisted in evaluating these models in a number of downstream tasks that we were interested. We have many data sets that are being covered, but we have 14 taxonomies related to, to tasks related to, to, to genre of music, uh, moods of music, and other high-level uh, music characteristics such as danceability, uh, if the music is voiced or instrumental, uh, the gender of the singer or the tonality. And as you can see, these data sets are very small, so they have from a few hundred to a few uh, thousand samples. So the methodology for the evaluation is very simple. As I said before, standard transfer learning. So we will extract the embeddings from the frozen models and we will train shallow uh, classifiers on top of them to assess the evaluation metrics. Our models consist on MLP classifiers with one single layer and 100 units. And the evaluation protocol is five-fold cross-validation with uh, normalized accuracy. So uh, this brings us to the first batch of results compared in this table. Um, what we can see is that uh, compared to, with a support vector machine baseline, only models trained in, in tagging tasks, so musician for music tagging, uh, VGGs for some tagging, and an additional VGG type of, of model, were uh, capable of imp improving the performance on top of the support vector machine baseline for most of the task. So this gave, gave us the, the, the initial intuition that we should train supervised model using the, the uh, targeting a semantic music tags to, to train our uh, own uh, representation learning model. So for this task, we rely on the data available in the Discox um, the uh, website, Discox is a music data set for uh, co uh, combining um, editorial metadata and also a marketplace for music enthusiasts. So it's not created by experts, but by uh, enthusiasts of music that want to, to share this information. And one of the reasons to focus on this type of information is that, uh, for example, Discox feature a fixed uh, taxonomy of music tags and genres, and it's moderated. So we believe that it would be more reliable than other sources of weak metadata, such as uh, Last.fm. So uh, with this information, we created our internal data set for pre-training that we call Discox 20. Um, this Discox comes from processing the, the monthly 
a global dump created by, by, by Discox. So basically they release all the information that they have uh, every month under CC0 license. And we choose uh, targeting the four, the top 400 music style available in, in this dump uh, that we will, were able to match to 3.3 million tracks and uh, also to YouTube links. So we were able to download uh, MP4 data for, for this data set. So with this data set, we created uh, our baseline model for the rest of the thesis called Discox FNet. Um, there are not many technical contributions in, in developing this model. So it's a CNN uh, architecture. We compared the state of the art models back then and uh, we found that the Fission Net Zero with only four million parameters was the model providing the, the best performance. So use, use this model. It's trained in two second uh, chunks of MEL spectrogram um, <coughs> uh, uh, duration and um, we will use it to extract representations and compare it with uh, our previous uh, uh, benchmark. So in this table we show the performance of the Discox FNet model compared to, to the two best models from the previous section. Uh, in green you can see that uh, our model achieves superior performance in most of the tasks but this is something that we could step because we were using a more update uh, architecture and also much more training data than the previous model so it, it's something that, that would um, make sense but now we have a nice uh, representation model. So uh, the next question we know that we can achieve good performance when evaluating in this downstream uh, small downstream data set next question is can we generalize the performance uh, of these models to other data is, are these representation helping the generalization capabilities so the motivation for this research is previous um, previous uh, works in MIR showing that uh, typically audio classifiers fail to gener generalize when, do, when you evaluate in a different data set. So we wanted to see what happened in the context of uh, transfer learning. So for this, we created a, a, a internal data set that we call MTG uh, Jamendo 10K. It, this data set is basically a subset of 10,000 tracks of the MTG Jamendo that we annotated according to the taxonomies of the 14 downstream classifiers that we were evaluating. And we want to do a cross collection evaluation, uh, evaluation and see if uh, our models uh, are able to achieve um, higher performance than a baseline that is trained uh, from scratch. So this is uh, the setup. Uh, now the representation model is frozen, the downstream classifier is frozen. We evaluate in this subset of MTG Jamendo and the labels are uh, created according to the taxonomy of a downstream data set, for example, the, the GTSAN data set. Um, this evaluation brings us to this uh, new table of results where we have uh, two groups of columns. The first group of columns is within collection validation. So we are comparing our disk of FNet model with a musician model trained from scratch in the five-fold cross-validation setting. And what we can see is that our model, our representation are useful and we can achieve higher performance. But most of the time it's only a few uh, per percent points of accuracy improvement, which is something that is not uh, so, so interesting maybe. But when we have a look at the evaluation in the cross-collection evaluation, what we find is that there are half of the data set where we achieve more than 10% improvement in accuracy, showing that this uh, representation learning paradigm has this hidden effect of improving a lot the, the, the generalization of the models, especially when the downstream task is very small in terms of training data. So uh, this is uh, the end of our chapter uh, based on representation learning, uh, using representation learning methods based on labels. We have uh, many more small experiments in, in the thesis. We just decided to set, uh, show a subset of them here. Some of the takeaways are that our Discord, uh, the music style labels in Discord are a suitable sort of a supervision to train representation learning models. This is something that could be expected. But, uh, Using these uh, representations to train uh, small classifiers have a huge impact in the general system capabilities that they have. So it's highly recommended when, when you have downstream tasks with, with a small amount of data. Um, <clears throat> and uh, for next steps of the thesis, now we are considering what other sources of supervision available in this COX we could use to keep improving the performance of our uh, representations. So this brings us to the next uh, section of the presentation, representation learning based on music uh, metadata. Um, the motivation for, for this uh, 
research uh, line is that Discox is, uh, apart from, from having the, the, the music stats level that we have using, it has a lot of uh, editorial metadata that could also be leveraged. So for example, the name of the release of a track, uh, the record label in which it was released, we have other information uh, such as the, the band members uh, and, and many others. So some of our hypothesis is that some of this data could be used to train representation learning models. Um, additionally, this is a type of data that could be uh, accessible in many industrial scenarios. So uh, understanding if, if this information is suitable can, can, could be beneficial for the community. So our goals now are to train representational learning models based on supervision using music metadata and to assess the difference between the model trained using different metadata notions to find which one is the most effective. Um, our first uh, effort in this direction um, leverage existing work using this type of information. So there are existing uh, pieces of research using the, the triplet laws to train uh, representational learning models using the artist name. So uh, these models work more or less in this way. So given the, the input representation of a song by a given artist, the model should, le should learn to attract the representation of songs by the same artist. And it should learn to also to repel the representations from different artists so that the embedding space is uh, more or less or organized. Um, we propose expanding this work uh, in two directions. First of all, uh, replacing the triplet loss by more advanced batch contrastive learning methods so we don't have to choose the negative pairs and the other is to lever the other way is leveraging the, the information in 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 Discord so that we have uh, up to 10 times more data than, than previous works so uh, the first question for our research is what's our strategy to select the anchor positive part to select to, to train the models. And we thought in uh, different approaches that I'll explain now. So the first one is a fully supervised approach in which we take crops of spectrograms from the same track. Um, yes, uh, completely sub-supervised. The second one is what we, the second approach is what we call the release or album association. So we take crops of audio that belong to the same release or album, but they uh, belong to, to uh, different tracks. The third one is the artist association. So uh, in this case, we take crops of audio from the same artist, but a different release. And the last one is the, the record label association. So crops of songs uh, that belong to the same record label, but to different artists. And note that we have designed uh, this association strategy so that the previous level is never contaminating the next one. So we don't have information about the artist in the, in the label association model so that we can measure the isolated impact of using each type of supervision. So uh, to train the model, we use contrastive learning, and particularly our method is based in, in, in the COLA model. Uh, the original is a self-supervised model where anchor and positive pairs are created by choosing um, separated crops from, from the same song. And our contribution is to modify this method by creating the list of positive and anchored uh, samples using one of the pair selection strategies that we have just uh, selected. So after creating the list list of anchors and positive, uh, the representations are passed through a convolutional encoder and then through a projection layer. And after this, we compute the, the similarities between all anchors and, and positives. And the model is optimized uh, to maximize the similarity between the correspondent anchor and positive pairs while minimizing the distance to the rest of uh, samples um, available. So, as in the original call implementation, we use the bilinear similarity. This can be thought of as a type of um, a cosine similarity with learnable weights that optimize a little bit the performance. And uh, we optimize the model with the binary cross-entropy loss. Uh, additionally, we consider the possibility of training the model with all the similarity notions uh, at the same time. So this time we have a shared encoder and we have separate parts uh, Part generators for each of the, uh, the modalities. And of course, we, we also have different projectors and similarity matrices for, for, for artists, for record label, uh, and so on. Um, so uh, to evaluate the model, we rely in the same uh, transfer learning setup that we did before. So we froze the encoder, we extract embeddings, and we train a small proving model, uh, an MLP classifier, to, to get the predictions and the metrics. Um, and to evaluate the model, we will use this time a little bit uh, uh, bigger data set, not, not very small data set, because this way it's easier to measure the difference in the performance. So we consider the magnetic attune uh, for general 
purpose music tagging and the different subsets of the anti-jamming dataset that has specific taxonomies for genre, instrument, mood and theme, and uh, also the top 50 tags in the MTG Jamendo collection. So in this table, we can see uh, the performance of, the, of different models based on the metadata associations that we have described compared to the Discox FNet baseline and compared to the multitask uh, model learning all the similarities at the same time. Uh, what we can see is that uh, the artist association model is the, the one achieving higher performance and it's uh, outperforming uh, our baseline in uh, most of the tracks, uh, but the MTG Jamendo instrument task. Um, and also another observation is that the multitask model, uh, so learning all the, the similarity notion at the same time, is not helping a lot to improve the, the, the performance. So it's probably not a good idea um, to do it the way I, I did. Uh, one limitation was that given the, the GPU memory limitation, I had to use smaller batch size with this model, which is something that is known to affect the performance of contrastive learning. So maybe this is related to the, to the, to the not so good performance of, of the multitask model. Uh, given the, the partial success of, uh, that we can achieve representation uh, and downstream performance that is comparable with this type of supervision, we decided to extend this approach to utilize another types of supervision based on metadata. So we moved to using consumption metadata. So consumption metadata uh, can be considered examples such as a music playlist, DJ set list, uh, listening history by, by user. So in general, it's information that encode music that is suitable for, for the same listening context. And again, this is a type of information that is very uh, accessible in industrial context. Because of this, this research was conducted as an in industrial internship in uh, Utopia Music, where they have access to different types of editorial of, of consumption metadata. But for this research, we will be focusing only in playlist information. However, these approaches could be expanded probably to, to, to other types of uh, consumption metadata. So again, we, we formulate the problem in a similar way. Our research question is how we uh, utilize this playlist information in a way that we get the better downstream performance. And we consider three approaches to process the playlist information. The first method is called concurrence. So it's basically the same idea we have been doing so far, taking the anchor and positive tracks from the same playlist. Um, the second method is top concurrence, so it can be considered as a filtered version of the method. So we consider anchor and positive from the same play playlist, but we only consider songs that appear in, in the top 10, that have the top 10 playlist in common. So it's a way of filtering tracks that are probably not so similar. And finally, we have a method called work uh, to back similarity. In this case, we model the playlist information as a separate modality, and instead of training a contrastive learning model to uh, attract to audio representations, we attract the, the audio representation to, to the playlist uh, embedding. Uh, this model is, create, is, is, is um, an auxiliary model that is not optimized jointly and is trained uh, as, um, without using any audio information. So we, trade, uh, we treat playlist uh, data as a sequence of song IDs and given mask uh, songs in this sequence of, of songs, the model needs to learn to predict it. So it learns uh, to produce some embeddings that uh, contain some contextual information about the about the music. So um, our uh, methodology is very similar to our previous approach, but this time we are using the Spotify million playlist data set to train the model uh, that contains 1.7 million songs and 1 million playlists on it. Uh, instead of using the COLA method, we moved to using SimCLR that is a very similar contrastive learning approach, but it was maybe a little bit more popular, so we wouldn't want to um, experiment a lot with the, with, the, with the contrastive learning method. And we evaluated in two architectures, so the BGGs and the ResNet 50 uh, model that have been successfully used in audio tasks. So this time, one of the difference is that instead of extracting embeddings and trained salary classifiers, because of the uh, interest of the, in the, uh, of the company in this internship, they prefer to uh, explore the possibilities of fine tuning the models in the downstream task. So the results that we will be seeing are not directly comparable what we had before. Um, this table, we show the results of our experiments. Um, we have three baselines this time. The first one is uh, fine tuning, uh, training uh, the models in the downstream task without any previous pre-training. Then we have a simple uh, SimCLR pre-training, so without using any metadata. And the next one is artist uh, concurrence, so basically the best approach that we found with the editorial metadata. So a model trained in, in artist concurrences. Um, 
our results show that some of the models based on playlist information are able to achieve higher performance that we have with our baseline. And particularly, uh, the world to back uh, model achieved higher performance than three out of four tasks and the best performance in two tasks. So we consider that so far this is the most convenient pre-training uh, strategy that we have been able to, to uh, find. Finally, to conclude this section, we have a final experiment. We wanted to evaluate the uh, capabilities of these embeddings and the tasks of perceived music similarity. And the hypothesis for this is that playlists encode a lot of information of, of, of similarity, so th they could be beneficial for, for it. Uh, in this task, we use a small data set called DIMSIN that contains 1,000 triplets of anchor, positive and negative track annotated by human raters. Um, and in this evaluation, we don't use any fine tuning. We, we just extract embeddings from the pre-trained models and measure the cosine similarity between the embedding of the anchor and the positive. And we consider it a correctly classified uh, element if the, this distance is smaller than the distance to the, to the, to the negative uh, sample. So the results show that the simple uh, model trained on playlists achieve higher performance, not the world too big, uh, too big version. So this suggests that Playlist information is useful, is useful and correlates with, with uh, perceived music similarity, but the training approach that optimizes discriminative capacities is not the best, the, the same that optimized uh, similarity um, approaches in this case. So that's all for this section and this type of supervision. Takeaways are that uh, music metadata is comparable or outperforms uh, semantic labels as a source of supervision and that modeling playlist information as a separate modality is the um, approach that provided better performance in our case. So for future work, we will consider expanding this method to other source uh, of consumption metadata. And also, uh, we consider that this type of supervision could be combined with the, with the types of supervision that we have seen so far to create a, a model that integrates all um, the knowledge. Finally, um, here we, we show in the performance, downstream performance in terms of mean, average pre precision uh, in the downstream task of uh, the different subsets of the MTG Jamendo, so for genre, instrument, and mood. What we can see is that there are small improvements in the performance uh, as we develop a, a new models. In this case, we are showing the performance with the artist association uh, model, so this means that slowly we are trying, we are finding models that optimize the downstream. Uh, performance of, 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 uh, in our task of interest. With this, we move to the next section, representation learning with transformers and patch out. In this section, we are not interested about the data we use to train the model. This, uh, we remove this variable and we focus in the architecture that we use to train um, the model. So the motivation for this is that Transformer had already, when we started this research like two years ago, Transformer has, had already shown promising performance in, in related tasks such as sound classification. Um, and it's particularly the patch out uh, technique for pre-training was offering a very good trade-off between performance and the amount of resources needed to train this type of model. So it was very convenient to, for our academic settings. Um, so the goals for the session is to experiment with training pure uh, self-attention based uh, models and to see how we can optimize the performance for the downstream task that we are interested in. This uh, slide shows the typical uh, pipeline of transformers operating with audio. So first of all, uh, given a two-dimensional spectral representation and optional data augmentation, uh, typical operation is to divide the signal into small square patches that are the tokens that are fed to the transformer. So self-attention is applied on, on top of these uh, units. Uh, since the transformer doesn't know how to, what's the relative position of the input token, tokens because of how it is uh, designed, we apply, uh, it's very typical to apply any type of uh, positional encoded. In our case, we are working with separate temporal and frequency encodings. And the patch out technique consists in just uh, discarding rows and columns of the input representation so that the model needs to, uh, it's a regularization technique that uh, forces the model to learn from a partial view of the input data. So typically when transformers are intended to solve classification tasks, there are one or several tokens, trainable tokens that are appended to the input sequence uh, of tokens. In this case, uh, we have a classification token and a distillation tokens that uh, after passing through all the transformer blocks uh, are used to, to uh, uh, with the help of a linear layer, uh, 
generate the, the, the class probabilities and solve the, the classification task. So the, the fact of having a distillation token is intended to have two different objectives, so solving the task and maybe distilling the knowledge of a pre, another pre-trained model. Um, Regarding patch out, we think that this is a very uh, interesting technique because it offers two benefits. Uh, first of all, it's a regularization technique, so it helps to improve the performance of the model by forcing it to learn from partial views of the input data. And the second is a speed up, so by design transformers are, uh, have a quadratic complexity re uh, respect to the input sequence length. So because of this, discarding parts of the input uh, helps to reduce a lot the amount of time and the amount of resources that you need to train these architectures. And, as I said, this is very convenient for academic settings when we don't have resources to train very large uh, models. So with that said, uh, our evaluation setup is the first one in the chapter based on labels. So we are evaluating, we are using the Discox 20 data set uh, targeting these top 400 music styles. And we have, we are, uh, as a string task, we are targeting the subset of the MTG Amendo, Magnetic Attune, and the Million Zone data set this time. So, the first uh, research question that we have is, what is the best embeddings to use from the transformer? We have uh, several possibilities using the classification token, these distillation tokens, and uh, averaging the output of the rest of the token. That is something that is very commonly done in the literature of uh, self-supervised learning with transformers. And also we have the question of what's the best layer to extract the transformer from, since there are um, different works suggesting that the last one is not always the best layer, as normally happens with CNN architectures. So we uh, basically treat all possible combinations and we found that the best representations from the transformer model for the downstream task we are interested in tend to be in the seventh or sixth layer of the model, so in the middle of the architecture, and that concatenating the, the CLS distillation and the average of the rest of the token slightly helps to improve the performance. So for the rest of experiments, we are using this uh, setup. Um, second question is related to initialization ways and this is because many works in the in the literature said that even if you have um, a lot of uh, inform a lot of data to train your transformer model initializing it to weights from pre-trained models is beneficial we made three experiments initializing it randomly initializing it with the weights of the deed model which is a vision uh, transformer and initializing it to the with the weights of the past model that is an audio classification uh, transformer and we found that the last setting what was optimized the performance for our downstream evaluation in the magnetune data set, which showed that this type of information is uh, beneficial in this context. Finally, uh, we have the results of the final uh, transformer models that we've uh, trained and evaluated under the, the settings that we have just seen. Um, our main baseline is, again, the Discox FNet model, and we propose three versions of the transformer, 10 in 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and 30 seconds of audio. Uh, what we can see is that uh, longer input seconds, uh, longer input sequences, sorry, correlates with higher performance, and the model training in 30, 30 seconds achieved the higher performance in most of the cases. And also, we were able to, to, to improve the performance on top of the baseline and also on top of most of the models in the state of the art. So, proposing uh, the best open representation learning model, since uh, some of the models that achieve higher performance are uh, closed and cannot be accessed. So uh, the conclusions from this section is that uh, transformers are worth uh, trying for representation learning in MIR, provide that you have suitable initialization weights, that uh, re the representations are extracted uh, from the suitable layer and token, and that you can provide uh, input seg uh, segments that are long enough for training them. So um, for future work, we will can experiment with using hybrid architecture, so combining convolutional and transformer blocks, such as the conformer, that uh, so show very relevant, very good performance in uh, speech task. And uh, we could, of course, combine our transformer with the sources of supervision that we have found in useful in the previous section, so music metadata. In our case, we couldn't go this direction because contrastive learning is very demanding in terms of patch size and transformers too, so it was not possible to combine the two uh, things in our context. So uh, going back to this uh, comparison of the uh, performance that we will be achieving now with the MAST model, we are able to uh, improve the performance in the subset of the Jamendo a little bit more, showing that uh, we are going in the right direction regarding representation learning. 
This we go to the last section, technical section of this presentation. Here we are not pre-training representational learning models anymore. Instead, we are um, focusing on interpretability of these models. So uh, in, in general, deep learning models are hard to interpret. And if they are based uh, on pre-trained representation, the problem is, is even more complex. So in this section, we want to understand what can be done in, in order to get some interpretability of what's going on. Um, so the goal are, is to adapt existing methods for interpretability in the context uh, of audio to work with uh, classifiers based on uh, pre-trained representations. And also to expand this method to work with tasks such as music classification, that is something that had not been done before. So um, in this case, uh, our method is, uh, relies on a training paradigm called prototypical learning. The typical black box classifiers, such as the MLP models that we have been using, uh, map uh, input samples to class probabilities in an obscure way that is hard to interpret. And on the other hand, prototypical classifiers work by assigning um, class probabilities according on, as function of the distance from the input samples to class, to, 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 sorry, to class prototypes that are optimized in the training process. So the benefits of th this type of methods is that after training, you can have a look at the prototypes and explore their geometrical properties or look at the na nearest neighbors to, to get some understanding on how they operate. So um, the approach we are based in leverages uh, this prototypical learning setup. Uh, it's called APNET, so Audio Prototypical Learning. And the uh, contribution is that the prototypes are learned in the embedding uh, latent space of an autoencoder. So the benefit of this technique is that after training, jointly training the model, the prototypes can be passed through the decoder module, and so they can be sonified. So you get an understanding of how the decision-making process is being done. Um, our first uh, intention was to uh, understand if this could be done in the embedding space of our pre-trained autoencoder without needing to, to, to jointly train the whole system. And for this, we start by evaluating training the prototypes in the latent space of a neural codec. In our case, we, we use a model called uh, encodec. But what we observed in this iteration is that this provided a very bad classification performance. It was not possible to, to get any uh, sonification that was making sense. And this correlates with other research uh, from the state of the art, so we thought that it's something that could be making sense. So to try to improve it, we replace uh, the encoder model by a mask autoencoder uh, transformer trained on top of this embedding that is called encoder my, uh, my Leonardo Pepino. So the idea is this method is a mask autoencoder model, so it needs to learn how uh, to, to, to generate missing part of the input sequence, so it could be making sense to try to make this embedding space more suitable for reconstruction. Uh, what we found in this second iteration is that this model, since it has some context information because of being trained to, to predict uh, mask regions, it helped a lot in improving the classification performance, but still the sonification was not, not good. So the conclusion is that not every point in this Latin Spain is suitable to, to pass through the decoder and get a sonification that makes sense. So to fix that, we go through for a third iteration where we decided to rely on a generative uh, decoder that finally uh, allows to good, uh, good uh, sonification. So this method works by extracting and correct my embeddings, but instead of training the, 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 the prototypical uh, model on top of them, we train a small transformer to summarize uh, these representations into a single CLS vector. And then we use it to condition a diffusion a process to go back to the encoder embeddings and generate the, the audio. And this is something that allows like a trade-off on within classification performance and sonification. So to give you an idea, after training the model, we uh, train the prototypicals in the embedding space of uh, the uh, encoder, and we can go through the diffusion process to, to, to um, go back to audio from, from the prototypes. Um, so to evaluate this, me this method, we have three data sets, midly solo DBs uh, for instrument classification, GTSAND for, for, for general classification, and we created a specific data set called Chai Genera. So we wanted to see how the model performed when you had more uh, higher genera resolution. And in this table, we show the performance comparing the model to the baseline AP uh, method. So the first thing that we can see is that when we use five prototypes per, per class, our method was able to achieve higher performance than AP18-2 out of three data sets. And our setup, uh, since we are training the prototypical network uh, without needing to train an encoder, we can train for much more prototypes and increasing it to uh, 40 is also hard to, 
to uh, improve the, the uh, classification performance. Um, regarding sonifications of our model, I have a few examples on how the sonifications for the GTA, uh, prototypes for the jitters and data sets sound like. So one of the first observations is that uh, these samples doesn't sound like realistic music and it can be uh, disappointing in the first terms. But another way of looking at it is that uh, this model, what it's doing is, is reproducing the information that is contained in the, in the prototype. So uh, for example, as in the last example, if there is no temporal coherence in this embedding, it probably means that uh, the model doesn't need temporal coherence uh, to solve the classification task. And instead, it's focusing in other aspects, such as the instrumentation, the, the type of singing, in the case of rigging music. So um, the way we see it, uh, this model is not suitable for final application. With, we, you, final user would expect like, very uh, beautiful sonifications. But this is very useful for model developers, so that they can get an understanding on how the model is operating and in which aspect of music it's focusing to drive the decision-making process. So that's the end. Um, of this uh, section, uh, the main takeaway is that we have proposed this um, sonification approach called PECMA that's allowed for uh, training prototypical classifiers on top of pre-trained representation uh, learning models. And um, one very evident direction for future work is replacing the, the codec my features coming from an autoencoder by highly discriminated features such as the masked embeddings that we presented in the previous sections to see if we uh, can get understanding on how different features affect the, the decision-making process. With that, we are moving to the last section of the, of the presentation, uh, application and outreach. Here we'll be discussing how the efforts we have made on making our models available for the uh, music uh, and sound uh, community. So first of all, I would like to talk a little bit about Essential Models that was already introduced. Essential Model is a repository of model that we created to be used in the context of Essentia. We have already put more than 300 uh, models in this uh, library and they can be used uh, both in C++ and, and Python. And for some of the models also, we have uh, JavaScript uh, wrappers. The website offers weights, uh, metadata information, and code snippets on how to use uh, the model. And the companion package, uh, the Sensia TensorFlow, has more than 6,500 monthly downloads showing that it's been used, and, uh, used by, the, by the audio and MIR communities. Additionally, we have been putting an effort on creating uh, uh, demos of our models. And uh, I wanted to introduce also Essentia JS that was um, a build of Essentia intended for JavaScript so that it can be used directly in the browser created by Alvin Correa. So it's suitable for serverless application. A part of our work, work was porting some of our models so that it can be used in TensorFlow JS uh, in the browser also as uh, um, the rest of algorithms of Essentia JS. So we have an example here. It's very similar to the first demo that we show, but the difference this time is that we are not using a server. Everything is running real time in the browser. It's a tagging demonstration. So again, our pipeline allows for real-time inference with, with these models, and in this case, um, yeah, uh, running directly in the browser. Uh, next thing I would like to introduce is the Essentia API. Essentia API is a project in which we are exploring commercialization opportunities for the research uh, outcome of this thesis and Essentia in general. So basically the idea is that we can take the competitive advantage of the representation of learning pipeline. So we have uh, the possibility to have very efficient uh, inference uh, pipelines in which we extract embeddings and then we run for a big number of classifiers. And we also have a very uh, 
a setup that allows us to develop in models very, very quickly, so to be very highly adapted. So, so far we have already received uh, two types of funding. The first one is internal funding here in the UPF, so the Maria de Mathieu project for two years, where we will explore the expansion of these technologies. The second is the Industria del Conocimiento uh, Yabor project that has been running for six months and we are uh, bringing our technologies from TLR4 to TLR6. So uh, basically creating a platform where we can run the Sencia models. Also regarding dissemination, we already present a late breaking demo paper in this 2022 presenting the idea of our API. And this year we presented it as the Sonar Music Festival here in Barcelona. Regarding other additional uh, APIs, we have made an effort to include in our models in the Replicate website and in the Hugging phase. And in total, we have achieved more than 3 million runs and downloads of our models, showing that it's being used by the, by the community. And finally, I would like to talk about two uh, real-world applications that are already using our technology. So the first one is the cosine.club website, um, which is an electronic music similarity engine based on our model for uh, artist embeddings. Um, recently, the, this uh, website received a certain repercussion in the electronic music community and it was featured in a relevant press such as Resident uh, Advisor. The second example is Submit Hub. This is a music promotion website. So, in this, this website, artists upload their, their music uh, and they want to get recommendations of uh, playlist curators to promote their music. So one problem that they have is that artists have a very bad experience finding the, the suitable genre tags to, to get recommend, recommended to the appropriate um, uh, playlist curator. So we start experimenting with using our MAST model for this and they uh, reported that they're having very high user satisfaction uh, with the genre suggestions from our models. So um, that was all regarding application outreach. Now we'll move to the final conclusions um, to wrap up the presentation. So uh, first of all, uh, representational learning based classifiers generalized better than shallow models. Uh, the models based on music metadata achieve a similar or higher performance than the models based on semantic labels, so it's a very suitable source of supervision. Um, Pure self-attention-based transformer uh, achieve higher performance than our previous model uh, based on CNN. So there are suitable architecture for training models provided that you have sufficient pre-training data, input sequence length, and uh, suitable initial weights too. And we have presented a methodology that allows for um, creating representation learning based classifiers that is interpretable and allows for, for understanding the effect of the, of the features on the final classifiers. And finally, throughout this thesis, we have uh, been achieving a progressive, uh, progressive improvement in the downstream task of interest. So this is something that we have reflected in this uh, graph here, where we saw how in the uh, different subset of the MTG Amendo, different representational learning that we have been proposing have slowly keep improving uh, the performance, the downstream performance, uh, according to the uh, mean average precision metric. So, uh, Finally, open questions on future perspective of the thesis. Uh, first of all, one big question is, uh, what's my opinion on self-supervised learning? We have been adapting many self-supervised uh, learning methods to operate uh, with supervision, even uh, metadata notions, but more updated uh, self-supervised methods, such as those based on mask autoencoders and supervision, allows, for example, for um, supervision with a uh, much higher temporal resolution that allows to create representation learning models that are suitable for most tasks. And this is the current research direction that we are following. Uh, my vision is that this type of approaches could be combined with the information uh, that we have in the models based on metadata to get the best of both worlds. Uh, second point is uh, multitask approaches. So in this thesis, we have been exploring isolated ways of supervising the models, but of course, uh, this could be combined in a single model that learns all the information at the same time. This is something that we explore a bit in the uh, third, fourth chapter of the thesis, sorry, but without very satisfactory results, but I think it's a direction that deserves further um, research. Regarding uh, music understanding evaluation, we have only been evaluating our models in tagging tasks, but uh, this can be considered quite limited and future direction could uh, I think involve uh, training models that can operate in a question, in answer, question answering manner so that we can get more nouns understanding on how uh, they understand music. 
And regarding interpretability, uh, we have proposed an approach that allows for creating uh, sonified uh, prototypical classifiers, but we have only experience with uh, self-supervised uh, models for the um, for the, for the pre-trained input features. And this approach that deserves expanding it to other types of representations to see what's the, the impact that they have in the sonifications. So finally, I will get to wrap up with the outcomes of this thesis. Uh, regarding research contributions, we have published six uh, peer review publications and two of them received uh, awards. Um, we have contributed also to other four peer reviews uh, publications. And additionally, our research recently received a grant. Uh, so we got four, uh, 500,000 hours of GPU compute to continue our research in representation learning in, in uh, association with the Barcelona Supercomputing Center here, Barcelona. And regarding industrial contributions, we have a field, a pattern in the context of my internship in Utopia Music. Uh, our research received two grants for commercialization of the resulting technologies. Um, our models put in um, external APIs achieve around 3 million downloads and runs, so proving that they are beneficial and useful for the audio community. And our package, Essential TensorFlow, has uh, more than 6,500 uh, monthly downloads showing that it's been uh, used in research. Um, finally, we have created more than 300 representation learning and classification models, and we have been putting them in Essential Models website to uh, benefit the, the MIR community so that it can be used for, for research. So that was all, and thank you very much for attending the presentation, and now I'll be happy to, to answer your questions. <laughs>